We've been there from the beginning, when horse-drawn carriages were more than just a tourist attraction, when thunders from the combustion engine ignited the hearts of a generation, when the sky became our new highway, when the moon and stars were not only within reach, but under our feet. Mobility connects cities. Mobility moves mountains, takes us on adventures, breaks barriers and records. Mobility brings us together and brings us home safely. Movement defines life. And for over a century, SAE International has been there, pushing boundaries, driving the evolution of engineering technologies and keeping watch as the fearless authority for innovation in automotive, aerospace, and commercial mobility. A global community of over 200,000 engineers, technical experts, and volunteers have built SAE's powerful and growing cohort of shared knowledge, creating the most reliable and comprehensive collection of engineering resources and consensus-based standards on Earth. Mobility is the shared gift and aspiration of all humankind. It is our mission to advance that gift well beyond the limits of possibility, while ensuring the safest, cleanest, and most accessible solutions reach the global marketplace, so you can reach those you care about most. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the HP 3D Printer Tech Review and Virtual Tour. My name is Roxanne Leffler and I'm the Senior Event Coordinator at SAE Detroit Section. Today, I have the privilege of introducing to you Ryan Zemmer, Marketing Manager from Novastar Solutions. Welcome, Ryan. Well, thanks, Roxanne, and hello, SAE members, and thank you for having me for this HP 3D Printer Tech Review and Virtual Tour. My name is Ryan Zemmer, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Novastar Solutions. So first, I'd like to provide a little background on Novastar for those of you who may not be familiar. Novastar has been around for over 20 years, and we provide large-scale IT asset deployments, test equipment calibrations, Dassault design software, in addition to the HP 3D printing solutions I'll be discussing today. Novastar is an HP Amplify power partner, providing sales and service for HP 3D printers in the region. So if you'd be interested in this technology, we're the one that's gonna take you from the discovery phase, uh, get you familiar with the technology, how to best use it. We'll do the install at your location as well as any service in the future. So we're gonna be your full service solution provider. So to start off, I'd like to address the question, why 3D printing? So most of us have probably been exposed to 3D printing over the last 15 years as a modeling and prototyping solution, but there have been some significant leaps in the last five years regarding technologies that can produce production grade and use parts. The argument for utilizing 3D printing usually includes one or more of what I consider to be these five pillars of additive manufacturing. The first I'd like to cover is flexibility. As COVID emerged, you may have seen articles about how contract manufacturers and owners of 3D printers were able to quickly pivot to help provide solutions for healthcare workers and patients alike. The flexibility of a 3D printer allows you to manufacture virtually anything you like. And this is particularly useful when in new product developments is you can produce multiple iterations of a design at the same time and then test which works the best. Also, if each part can be unique to the next, it becomes very easy to include unique identifiers such as serialization, branding, or elements for production tracking. Next is design complexity. In the past, traditional manufacturing methods set the boundaries for how products can be designed and parameters like mold restrictions or requiring multiple parts for an assembly often designate what a design or part can and cannot be. With 3D printing, we like to say that design complexity is free, and typically speaking, you can manufacture whatever you like without considerations of traditional manufacturing limitations. Lead times for parts are virtually eliminated, as you can have a prototype or an entire batch of parts in a couple business days. Depending on the quantities that will be required for your project, you may be able to avoid tooling costs entirely. At the bare minimum, you'll have functional production intent parts that can be utilized for testing and validation to help avoid tooling changes in the future. Material costs can often be reduced by utilizing a less costly material, 
lightweight and part designs, and in the case of HP 3D printers, recycling unused material into future builds. Labor costs can typically be cut as much of the printing process as hands off, avoiding things like milling or processing time. So to expand on those points, I wanted to share this particular case study from HP. And the part you see here is a drill extraction shoe for removing excess material. Uh, the design is very complex and traditional manufacturing required nine individual pieces plus fasteners in order to create this part. So by moving to additive manufacturing, they were able to achieve flexibility in their design by consolidating the assembly and reducing the total volume of the part by shaving unnecessary features that you can see on the A surfaces here. So as you compare the, the image to the left or the right, you can see a lot of mass has been minimized. So using PA-12 was significantly less expensive than machining aluminum at only a tenth of the weight and yet could still serve the same functional requirements uh, as far as strength and support goes. So the lead time and production costs were significantly reduced, resulting in a final production cost of 95%. So this particular case, excuse me, case study includes all five pillars that I mentioned previously. And this is a textbook example as why you would want to use 3D printing. HP has released three different models of 3D printers that all use their powder bed multi-jet fusion process to manufacture parts. These models include the 300-500 series, the 4200 series, and the latest release, the 5200 series. The first is the 500-300 series. So this unit's nice because it's a standalone model and everything happens in the unit you see here. It's smaller size primarily utilized for prototyping applications, but the ability to print in full color provides a lot of options for low run manufacturing. The 300 series is available as a device as a service, which is a very economical and predictable way to get your feet wet with a commercial grade 3D printer. So here are the, some of the parts that were produced with the 500 series. On the top left, you can see a infant's protective helmet that was actually printed from a custom 3D scan of that child's head. Uh, the bottom left was an anatomical model of a heart being used to plan for an upcoming surgery. The Mayo Clinic has actually bought a 500 series specifically for these purposes, and it's being adopted by some other medical facilities as well. In the bottom middle here, we have a finite element analysis that was overlaid on a bracket to show the strengths and weaknesses for design review and testing. And the bottom right is a fixture that utilizes colors and labels to aid in assembly. So again, there's a lot of options there. And the top right is an architectural model, which obviously saves an incredible amount of time over the, the typical form, foam core modeling that, that would be done in the past. So the next is the 4200 series, which is the first model introduced for low to mid level production. It's composed of a printer, a processing station, and one or more build units. Uh, these machines print in gray, but colors can be achieved through dyeing or painting of parts. And the 4200 can utilize all of the available materials with the exception of polypropylene. So here's some examples of parts completed on the 4200. On um, the top left is a battery array that was used for an electrified motorcycle. Um, that's just a good example of the electrical isolation and the properties in the material. And the top middle is a complex design for an air duct that was actually created after utilizing simulations to optimize airflow. The top right is an intake manifold developed for a racing team, and that speaks towards both the excellent air tightness and durability, as this is a part that was actually used on the vehicle itself, not just for prototyping. On the bottom left is a full front fascia that was made uh, by HP by connecting multiple different parts. So it's a great example of how dovetails and other joinery can be used to make parts larger than the build volume of the printers itself. In the bottom right, you can see the raw finish of a side mirror, as well as one that had been painted for production intent prototyping. So the 5200 series is the latest model released to scale production even higher. This model has some enhancements over the 4200 series, such as single pass balanced mode and some redundant heating lamps that can help ensure a build continues if something were to fail along the process. Um, it too is compromised of the printer, the processing station, and one or more build units like the 4200 series. But here in the middle, that smallest uh, item you can see is called a natural cooling unit. And the addition of those natural cooling units allows a facility to maintain a constant workflow without tying up build units for cooling time. So as the finished build can be pushed up into the cooling unit and set aside until it's ready for unpacking. 
much like the 4200, the parts do print in gray, but they can be dyed, painted, painted or plated. Um, and the 5200 series being the latest release can utilize all of the materials developed for a multi-jet fusion. So PA11, PA12, PA12 glass bead, uh, you have TPU, this one for the 5200 series, that's from the BASF variety, as well as the polypropylene. So here's a few sample parts off the 5200. So the top left, it kind of goes back to that customization and the versatility of additive manufacturing, because this was a, a customized part for customers. It's kind of a bit difficult to see here, but it actually says Bill over that speaker cover there. Um, the bottom left is a functional end-use air duct that was done for prototyping. Um, the rest of the parts were all developed to help battle COVID, and that really speaks towards the vis versatility that 3D printing offers. You know, companies were quickly able to switch into production without needing any new tooling or development costs. So now that we've covered the, the materials, uh, the models, I'd like to show you a short video on the production of series of the, the workflow for the 52, I'm sorry, for, for all of the machines. Um, I know that the audio didn't come out the best on this particular, so bear with me. Um, again, if you have any questions, I will try and, and answer them as we go or uh, clarify any things with the video here. How you doing? My name is Joe Katie with Noble Star Solutions. I'm here to show you around our demo lab. First, we have the 4200 series. This is HP's initial jump into additive manufacturing. This is the first machine that bridges the gap between rapid prototype and additive manu manufacturing. You can actually do short run productions on this machine. Next, it is the full color prototyping machine, the 580. And then finally, we have HP's full scale industrial production machine, the 5200. The pieces of the system comprise of the printer itself, processing station and the building. The build unit is what gets us past the rapid prototype phase and into the additive manufacturing phase. These build units can be interchanged between the processing station and the printer to always keep manufacturing going. The processing station is where everything starts and stops. You fill your build units full of material, you transfer it over to your printer. While this one's printing, you bring your old build unit that has printed product in it put it back in the processing station, and then you can go ahead and empty it out, reclaim your used powder, and reset it up and reprint it again. The first thing we want to do is take our empty building and insert it into the processing station. We'll select on the front panel how much material we want to load into the building unit. Open the building unit up. Insert the fill nozzle. At this point, the machine is going to take 20% fresh powder, 80% recycled powder, blend it in the mixer, and fill up your building. Alright, so at this point, we have a full building unit. Now we're going to tra transfer it over to the printer. So next, we have to pick our part and send it to the printer. So at this time, I already have a selected part. Our preferred file types are STL and 3MF. If you're printing in color, you're going to want to use the 3MF. In Build Manager, we can orientate our part the way we'd like. And we can set it up. I can fill in my fill volume. At this point, I can fill up any free space with any other parts. It doesn't matter. As long as you keep your packing density reasonable. And at the top here, you'll see how long our printing takes. So I'm going to go ahead and send this to the printer. All right, so now we send the job to the printer. We can verify our job is there. And then go ahead and hit print. At this point, we'll close our top. All right, so apologies there. I uh, took that moment to play that video and realized I didn't have my camera on that whole time. So now we've got that sorted out. Uh, 
So again, just kind of as a recap, um, those build units themselves are kind of the central uh, portion of the whole workflow of the machines. So as you may or may not have been able to hear from Joe there, that build unit goes into the processing station. It gets loaded with the powdered material. That build unit transfers over to the printer where the printing process actually happens. And then it goes back to the processing station to unpack your parts and recycle any powder that was not used in the actual process. So I wanted to hit the pause button there for a second to give you a better look at how the printing process of HP Multijet Fusion actually works. And the image on the screen here is an actual look under the hood of the 3D printer. So you can see some of the heat lamps as well as the thermal camera in the center there that helps regulate this thermal fusion process. So HP leveraged their expertise from years of 2D printing when designing their 3D printers. Excuse me. Somewhat similar to a 2D printer, an overhead carriage sprays a fusing and detailing agent into 80 micron layers of powdered material. So it spreads out a 80 micron layer of powder and then it's going to print those agents on top of that. So here in this diagram, you can see that the pro progression of a 3D printed part in process, which is represented by the fused dark area there. So the black dots represent the fusing agent where the part will be grown and the blue dots represent the detailing agent to define the edge of the part and separate it from the powder that will not be fused. So thermal energy is then applied from the overhead carriage, fusing the material to the previous layer, which you can see in steps two and three. And then this process is repeated by spreading a new layer of material, fusing agents, thermal energy, and so on to build hundreds if not thousands of layers for a given build. And to better explain this process, I wanna show you a short video. Thanks to HP's unique multi-agent and multi-pass printing process, material is spread evenly across the build platform. A print carriage containing an HP thermal inkjet array passes over the work area, printing fusing, detailing, and coloring agents on the material. During another pass of the carriage, the area is exposed to fusing energy, which bonds the part layers together. Unlike other 3D printing technologies, multi-jet fusion technology prints each layer of new material and agents on top of a previous layer that is still molten so that both layers fuse completely and polymers can lock in with each other across the layer boundary. The build platform is then lowered layer by layer by precise mechanisms, achieving fine detail and high dimensional accuracy for small features with optimal mechanical properties and delivering strong, quality, detailed, and functional parts. So now we're gonna head back to Joe in the demo lab, and I'd like to show you some of the technologies we've developed to help assist the workflow of this powder bed manufacturing. So there's obviously both the, the, the collection nozzle that Joe had in his hand there as well. And then you can see some vents in the background there that help any of this loose powder from kind of floating around in the air. So again, all this powder that's, that's not being utilized in order to grow the parts is actually gonna go right back into the machine and be recycled into future builds. So you have very, very little wasted powder or unused powder. Um, from that point, after you take the parts out of the, the machine or from the processing station, you would typically have to come over and do a manual bead blasting process. And what that does is just takes all of that final surface, that A surface powder off the parts and gets it down to the raw finished part itself. So this is, uh, you know, like I said, just part of the, the post processing uh, process that's required in order to get your end parts. And, you know, once you cleaned them up here, you could take them and have them dyed. 
And this is a technology here that we developed for our own use, but it's something that we're probably going to release to the market soon. So this particular one is what we refer to as Nova Tumble. And what this does, is it just helps aid in that entire depowdering process. Uh, it automates it. You can hook the vacuum right up to it for the automated powder collection. And it's great because in usually typically, you know, one to five minutes, you can sit there and depowder all of those parts. What's really slick is that that basket that was depowdering is modular. So then it comes over into our next product here, which we call Nova Blast, which once again, replaces all of that manual sandblasting process. And that can cut things down from upwards of an hour down to, uh, you know, again, maybe five or 10 minutes, which is all hands off. So a, a great solution that we've uh, developed there. Here we are back at so as you can see, as we kind of discussed, the build unit is at the heart of the workflow process. So as I discussed, you know, again, this depends on the material that you're using, but typically speaking, an 80 micron layer is going to be stacked in each layer of the, the printing process. And that build volume will eventually grow at about an inch per hour, which can depend again on the settings or the material that's used. But you'll need an approximately that same amount of time that you did to print as to cool the parts. But again, this, this does vary based on material. So with the, the, the 4200 series and the 5200 series, you can see the build volume is about the same. It's roughly about 15 inches tall, 15 inches deep, and a little over 11 inches wide. And here you can see with uh, some of the sample parts we had, we're able to pack 140 parts into that build that were roughly the dimension of two by two by three inches. Um, as Joe alluded in the video, the build unit can be used for a partial build. So let's say you only had a need for maybe 70 of the parts. You could fill the build unit up uh, with only half of the powder and do a half build print as well in order to accelerate processing time. So while the surface resolution of the HP 3D parts is very good, you can enhance it even further by changing the orientation within the printing plane. So typically if you have an A surface or a top surface that you're, you're really interested in having the best surface resolution on, that's something that you would typically orient face down into the, the build manager that was shown before. Um, again, it's pretty rare that you are going to get some stepping or poor resolution, but there are different tricks and tr uh, tips that you can use to, to really improve the, the final resolution of the parts. And as we kind of talk through this, um, because MJF is a 3D printing thermal controlled process, it's important to be mindful of the heat soak that can occur with flat surfaces. So if you have a part that's ideal to be produced on the XY plane, you can regulate the thermal soak through the part design itself. So if you needed to print a, a box or a doghouse like you see here, you can actually change the design in order to modify the cross section of the part as it is printed. So you can see the differences in the cross section for each design as you move from left or, um, well, I guess from top to down or left to right. Um, you can also manage the thermal process by orienting parts on their side. But again, these instances would be for a part that would be ideally oriented on the XY plane. For particularly dense parts with a high thermal requirement, it's also ideal to increase part separation and change orientations within the packing. So this can be countered by reducing the mass of the object by hollowing them or adding lattice structures. And this would not be an issue for thin, smaller parts. The build manager will actually tell you the density of your build and the help assist you with that packing orientation. So next I'm gonna take an opportunity to review all of the different materials that are used for MJF printers. The first three you want to cover is the PA11, the PA12, and the PA12 glass bead, which are all variants of nylon. These are the first materials released for MJF, and they have a lot of versatility and wide applications. Uh, a lot of the parts that were produced for the first couple of years were all in one of these three materials. So the PA12 serves as a nice middle ground, whereas the PA11 is often better for flexibility, and the PA12 glass bead is ideal for something that really need rigidity in your part. So each material has an 80% recycle rate, meaning any material not fused into the part, again, can be utilized into future builds. All that uh, recycling is automatic as shown. So the next material I wanna cover is polyurethane, often referred to as TPU. This material excels for applications requiring impact absorption, flexibility, or soft touch, uh, where you don't wanna mar any parts, such as um, uh, dunnage or, or any nesting that you would do with parts. 
So while the material is flexible, it's still airtight due to the MJF fusing process. And on the right, you can see it was used to make suction cups for some end of arm tools. And on the left is a lattice structure that was developed actually for the interior of a headrest. It was kind of a test project, uh, but you can see it'd be very comfortable, uh, good for impact absorption, very squishy. And uh, both of these parts you see here were developed by one of our customers, Xtol, over on the west side of the state. So the next material I'll cover is polypropylene. Uh, this material excels at water and chemical resistance, making it great for things like fluid reservoirs. It also maintains all of the properties of polypropylene, allowing things like hot plate welding, spin welding, or heat staking to other assemblies that you can see here on the bottom right. So the bottom left is an example of two parts that were hot plate welded together. Uh, the weld is actually very strong, stronger than the base material itself. So they did some pressure tests to this and where it failed, it was actually up on the, the top edge of the container itself. Um, it's difficult to see here because this part was already hot plate welded, but there's interior baffles inside of that, which is kind of the reason why it was done in two different pieces and then assembled afterwards. So this material is a bit trickier to design for and requires longer cooling times than something like nylon, uh, but it does open the door for a lot of great new applications here in automotive and other medical industries. So talk about uh, so kind of some design capabilities here for, for MJF as well. So again, the big benefit of HP 3D technology is the ability to print air and water tight parts. So on the left here is an end of arm tool where the vacuum lines are actually printed into the end effector itself. Um, you can do things like integrate channels for O-rings or clamps directly onto parts. And the top right corner here is a pressure chamber that we did just kind of for our own testing and validation, similar to something like a, a, a paintball tank. And that chamber right there only has about a three millimeter wall thickness, but we pressurized it up to 125 PSI, corked it for the night, and when we came back the next day, it didn't have any bleed down. So it really just speaks to how well the fusing technology itself works. You can embed uh, one part within another to create moving parts or hinges if needed, um, as long as you have a minimum tolerance in there uh, in order to, like I said, kind of uh, insulate the powder in there so it separates the fusing of the two different parts. You can do something like the part you see here on the left. Um, you can also achieve flexibility through design. You know, the spring here is printed as a single piece assembly with an inner and an outer, but the coil design itself actually provides flexibility within the part. And the part on the right is pretty cool because that's a uh, pick and place actuator for, for medical vials that works under positive pressure. And in the middle there, you can see some pretty finite hinges. You know, they're pretty small. This thing's only about the size of the palm of your hand. But this particular part was actually tested over a million cycles. And I think that really just speaks, uh, again, towards the, the quality of the materials, the property of the materials. Typically, you would expect a piece of plastic to fatigue much sooner than that. Um, but again, you know, if, if a million cycles isn't long enough, it's real easy to print off another one and get it back on the production floor. Being able to incorporate threading into parts is a great feature. So here you can see threads that are printed directly into the part for a pneumatic application on the left. And the sample part we have here on the right uh, not only shows the threading capabilities, but also texturing like knurling. Um, so the points on that knurling are rather sharp and really speak towards the finite details you can achieve with these parts. In instances where integrated threads are not sufficient, you can heat stake metallic fasteners if needed. Uh, this does take some practice, but it's a very viable application. And you can utilize that process on all of the materials with the exception for TPU. Lattice structures are typically utilized for light weighting and reduction of material use within parts, but they can also provide variance in support and impact resistance. So in this application, a TPU is printed in different lattice thicknesses to showcase the variable uh, flexibility and resistance that you can get just through design. So on the left, the lattice is very thick. It's almost impossible to compress, but on the right, it's very thin and very ductile. 
Embossing and engraving parts is another great possibility for these machines. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can uniquely serialize each part that's printed, embed QR codes, add branding. It just really gives you a lot of options uh, to avoid within you know, further processing because you can integrate that directly into the parts themselves. So the part shown here on the left is actually a cool example because it uses the PA-12 for the base for a nice, strong, rigid support, but then has a replaceable TPU nest on the top for the soft touch functionality. So if in the event those TPU nests were ever to wear out, you could simply pop one off and pop on a new one. Textures can also be achieved in MJF parts by overlaying your designated texture onto the A surface of a part design. So software like Material Magics can greatly aid in this process and additional applications like the joinery cuts and features uh, that showed on something like that front fascia earlier in today's presentation. And Materialized Magics, uh, we are a reseller of that as well. So again, it just goes into the full uh, value uh, offering that Novastar can provide. So combined with dyeing and post-processing, you can really get some excellent A surface on these parts. And we've also seen some great successes with one of our partners that are painting parts with Cerakote. Uh, and that, that was a great application to just to help increase the durability of the parts themselves. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your time today. Uh, I just wanted to end with this image here because it's just a small example of all the parts that we have here in our demo center. Uh, we are scheduling private one-on-one -on -one demonstrations with all safety precautions in place. So if anybody would be interested in coming in to see this technology in person, we would welcome that opportunity. Um, let us know again if you'd be interested in some sample parts. We have um, some of them that we showed today as well as a nice little sample parts kits and we could ship one of those out to your location. So if you have any interest in those, just feel free to reach out to us at info at novastar.net. And at this time, I would like to address any questions that we may not have had the opportunity to get to. So Roxanne, um, did you see anything come through here? No, Ryan, I've uh, been monitoring the chat box and it looks like uh, based off your presentation and the thorough uh, discussion and uh, that you went, it looks like, um, oh, we do have one that just came in. Yeah, uh, we'll give you a couple minutes here. Yeah, is the material FDA food contact approved? Uh, I'm going to say short answer, no. I mean, there are some different things you can do to try and get it more into that window of opportunities, but the material as itself, like as you're going to get that raw part right out of post-processing, no, it is not at this time FDA approved for, for medical uses like that, or food grade, I should say. Okay, let's give it another minute to see if there's some more questions that come in. Sure. It's pretty impressive you were able to turn around parts as you indicated um, in regards to COVID. You know, that was a, a pretty big deal uh, for that quick turnaround, so. Yeah, that was a big for a lot of HP 3D uh, providers. Um, they were able to do the, the support structures for face shields. Um, you know, back in the early days of it, when they were still trying to utilize uh, ventilators and things like that, they were able to do splitters so they could do uh, multiple ventilators for, for different patients. Um, yeah, there was just a huge uprising of service bureaus and, and 3D part manufacturers that kind of came to the rescue, quote unquote, because again, you could have, you know, batches and batches of parts within a couple business days uh, without having to go through all those design or, or tooling costs. Absolutely. That's fantastic. And now you can say HP3 um, printers um, are, are saving the world, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in some regards, you know, obviously the people behind them are a big part of it. But, That's right. Uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they're a great tool. It's, you know, it's something we're constantly using. A lot of people get them, um, you know, for, for one particular design or, or one instance or one use, but it's one of those tools that like, once you have one under your roof, you kind of find yourself just using it for a little bit of everything. Well, Ryan, it, it looks like uh, uh, it for our, our questions that came in. Um, again, we 
thank you for uh, presenting and um, sharing the knowledge that you have. And um, thank you to everyone that has joined us today. If anyone has any future or um, questions after this presentation, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at events at sae-detroit.org. And with that, um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, thanks again for having me. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.